Hi, in the 20th episode of Reframe Podcast, we introduce Summer, an email conversion strategist and copywriter for SaaS and e-commerce businesses. She's one of those rare kind of freelancers who started their own business right out of college. She spent 10 years in Dubai before moving to Pakistan in 2018. Today, she helps SaaS companies turn their free trials to paying customers through onboarding emails and helps e-commerce clients by creating customer experiences, focused emails that boost sales. If you get value out of this episode, we'd really appreciate a rating on iTunes and a sub to our YouTube channel. You can also subscribe to the podcast on all major streaming platforms. Please help us spread the message by sharing this in your network. Let's get into the 20th episode of the Reframe Podcast with Summer OS. All right, folks, welcome back to another episode. This is another lockdown session for the Reframe Podcast. And we have... Uh, Summer with us uh, today. Summer, work from home mom for a long time. How does it feel now with the kids also working from home? Uh, Hi, Farooq. Thanks for having me. Uh, But it feels crazier than usual. I've been working from home since 2011, right? And so I thought I had it down pat, like nothing could faze me. But the kids have been home since February 28th or 26th, I think. And it's, I wasn't used to it because I'd set up my entire routine of deep focus work when the kids were in school. And so now they're at home all the time. And sometimes I find it hard to even think. And that's hard, like, that's a tough position to be in, in my line of work. So it's, um, I don't know, it's, it's me getting used to having the kids around. It's the kids learning to you know, entertain themselves while mom's working. So it's a bit of mix of both. The first month was a washout. I I couldn't get anything done. Uh, I was irritated all the time. My kids kind of suffered because of that. But um, overall, I feel like we found my balance, um, our balance. And I've also gotten a lot more, I don't know, I've like lowered my expectations when it comes to client calls, especially. So I don't stress out as much if my kids come barging in while I'm on a Uh call because the good news is the same thing's happening to my clients and everybody else that I'm on a call with. So Mm -hmm. that is kind of really for like, I think world over that's like our expectations of professionalism has really just mellowed out. I feel like people are beginning to realize that even with kids around, it is possible to be professional and continue having um, a conversation. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and you've had your business for quite some time. In fact, I think you've had it since you graduated or something. Yeah. So I was, uh, this was a, this is an interesting story in a way. I got married. I was supposed to get married the night we had a big political assassination in Karachi. Mm-hmm. And soon after I moved to Dubai and I had just graduated a month before. And so the original plan was that I'm going to go and apply for a job. And this was um, Dubai before in 2008. The recession hadn't hit yet. Things were really, really good. And so I applied. And then I realized two interviews in that people weren't willing to hire somebody without a driver's license. And mm. so I applied for a driving license, figuring that I'll you know start applying again after I get my license. And the waiting period for the driving license the driving classes to start was six months. And so oh. I was like, what do I do? And while I was in Karachi, I used to write for this uh, blog called Metro Blocks Pakistan. Oh, sorry, Metro Block Karachi. And so I was like, I know that I can write. And I had had a piece published in the newspaper, which was I thought was a favor for a friend. But two weeks later, there was a check in the mail. And I was like, oh, there's money in this. <laughs> and so um, I Googled Um, you know, just uh, writing online, writing jobs online. Uh, And that's how I got started as a freelance writer. And by the time I got my driver's license, I like my freelance work, like the freelance bug had bitten me. I was not ready for a full-time job. I was like, no, this is, I'm having too much fun working for myself, writing on topics that I want to write about and learning all of this, these things that like a full-time job might not necessarily teach me. Mm. And so that's how it kind of, um, started and then in 2011 I got the I got this feeling like no I need to know what how the other half lives right so I want to experience the full-time job thing so I uh, found a job in a startup as their community manager 
and it was fun. It was a lot of fun, but it was also exhausting because the one thing I realized was that a nine to five job doesn't end at 5 p.m. I was going home working three to four more hours because I mean, social media jobs are like stressful to begin with. Mm -hmm. And within six months, I was like, no, I'm going back to my business. This is, I, I have, I had a, a kid by then and I was like, no, this is not working out for me. So within six months, I was back to running my own business and I haven't looked back since. All right. But you, you, you said nine to five agreed. Nine to five is never really nine to five, but then uh, when is your own business? A nine to five job. It's <laughs> a twenty four by seven, true. actually. You know. Uh, yeah. It's, I think it's more stressful. Although, I, although you got that taste of uh, being an entrepreneur so soon on in your career, practically never having to work a nine to five job. That's like an entrepreneur's dream. Yeah. But then, an entrepreneur's life is the most miserable life you can think of. Okay, so it's funny that you mention it because for the t- past two months, I've been running twelve to fourteen hour work work days. And yeah. it's only because I'm in like this intense growth mode in my business right now. But yeah. also it's, it's, I feel like it's the ownership thing where if I'm working the crazy hours, I'm seeing the output, right? And there's the satisfaction that I'm working on my own stuff. Mm. And so whatever I'm doing is going to give me results um, further along the line. And so I feel like there's a mindset difference when it comes to when you're working on your own business and when you're working on a full-time job, because if it's a full-time job, you expect to come home and just relax and like be able to switch off. And when that doesn't happen, there's a lot of frustration that builds up. Uh, But in, when you're working on your own business, it's kind of understood, but because as long hours as I pull, there are also times when, you know, things get hard or, or there's a, family matter that needs my attention and I can take a week off. I can cancel my calls. I can let my clients know that, Hey, something's come up. I need to reschedule. Um, and so having that flexibility, having that power is Mm. also a big motivator in, you know, uh, running my own business. Right. So I want to take this part and uh, segue into exactly motivation and challenges because it's not easy to build a brand, to build a business. And it's more frustrating in the beginning, especially. And I'm sure you would have gone through the same phases as every other business. So what keeps you going? What keeps people going and uh, yearning for that? We call it freedom, but uh, others call it, you know, mindless, you know, self, <laughs> self-pain, self actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so what keeps you going? For me, it's the nature of my work, to be honest, because I am and I, I started out as a freelance writer, but for the past two to three years, I've specialized in email marketing. And that has really just, um, there's always something new to learn, right? With every client, there are new challenges there, there with every project, there's something new that I get to learn. And mm. so I never get to feel like, oh, I've got this, I'm at the top of things, right? Uh, the feeling that I can figure things out and is always there. And that's a big motivator, right? So not knowing everything is, is what keeps me going. I feel like that's, that's, the, that's the mindset that like, that's the thinking that sets, up, sets us apart and gets us labeled as crazy to, mm. you know, be running our own business. But for me, that's a big, uh, big part of it. All right. So let's quickly have a little summary of your business. And uh, then so that, you know, for our listeners sake, so that we can relate our next question and discussions to your clients, to the challenges that you faced when you were starting up, you know, all the other things that come along with setting up a business. So I am an email conversion strategist and copywriter for SaaS and e-commerce businesses. So that means for SaaS companies that have like a product that is software as a service, I create onboarding emails and retention focused emails. So when, let's say you, a SaaS company has a free trial period, my job is to create a e- series of emails that convinces those fr- free trialers to convert into paying customers. And then once they're paying customers, then I create e- an email strategy and emails that keeps them as customers long term. And so right. it's um, onboarding and retention is my specialization in SaaS. And when it comes to e-commerce, um, I do the entire email marketing spectrum. So from designing um, um, a customer's email journey to creating all the primary sequences that are that are an e-commerce business's moneymaker to uh, email sequences that are um, that create customer loyalty within e-commerce uh, customers. 
So that is the bulk of my work. Mm-hmm. And I work with both. I, I find in, interestingly that I work with both industries and I love that both industries, even though like it's email marketing, but both of them have like such diverse and different email needs. Right. Okay. So in, in that respect, I mean, it's, it's basically mailing lists and getting connected to people through yeah. uh, newsletters and stuff like that. We Absolutely. hear yeah. many services online and the people are subscribed to a lot of services that do it for them. Uh, yeah. I understand, of course, customization, personalization, that's extremely important when you're, talk, when you're talk, talking about onboarding customers and retaining customers. Yeah. <clears throat> but... Um, do do act, businesses actually take this seriously? I mean, or do they they prefer the traditional method of uh, you know advertising and then uh, maybe hire influencers on Instagram or things like that to get the conversion flowing in? How how have um, you have you seen? So let me put it this way: when you started off uh, ten odd years ago, uh, from that time to now, is there an upshift into uh, businesses realizing the importance of email based communication because a lot of people say this is a very vintage kind of a, a methodology and now you know you know with the social media and all the platforms and all the influencer based marketing this is somehow going on the back burner um i find that over the years email has become uh one of the most important modes of communication because even though every few years there's a hue and cry that email is dead email marketing is dying it's not really mm-hmm. like people uh, will still unsub- like, delete their social media uh, apps from their phone when they get overwhelmed, but they never delete their email app. Like, right. and, and email is still personal, um, mm-hmm. even though so many of us uh, subscribe to company newsletters and brand, uh, brand newsletters, but it is still personal. It's that tiny little bubble of your, like, an inbox, which is mm-hmm. nobody else has access to. So this is your thing social media is stuff that other people can see your inbox is something that only you see and so it's one of the mediums that really it gives us a chance to connect with customers and i find that companies over time are really beginning to understand that the roi from email marketing is a lot higher than social media or influencer marketing because Uh um yes you can get those sales through influencer marketing and social media ads but then what next are you always going to be focusing on acquiring customers? What about, you know, making repeat customers out of the customers that you already have? And right. that's where email really shines. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that, that exactly that, that makes sense because uh, when I think of email, I think of urgency in action. And yeah. if I'm getting an email, uh, most of the times that I get emails from businesses is like, Hey, subscribe now. Uh, grab this offer now, you know, kind of urgency. Sometimes that puts uh, the customers off, you know, it's like you're not yeah. giving me enough choice or enough time to think about it, you know? Yeah, and whereas, so that's where, yeah. sorry, I cut you yeah, off. Go ahead, go but, ahead. That, but that's where um, a customer's email journey and an email strategy comes into play. So for an e-commerce business, that means that either somebody is coming onto your list because they've subscribed to your email list or because they've bought from you for the first time, right? And so there, these are two different events. And so you need to create a welcome email series for, for both these eventualities, right? And so if you just create one, and which is like when somebody subscribes to your email list, right? And somebody's placed an order with you, they're going to be thinking, okay, yes, nice that you're welcoming to your, to your, me to your list, but what about the purchase that I just made? Right. And so it, it's these little things, right? When you mention that, hey, thanks for your first order, we're, we're, just, we're so excited to have you. It's that tiny little customer experience bit that makes right. a difference and b- starts that movement towards building customer loyalty. Hmm. And so I feel like focusing on customer experience, especially in emails, is really, really important. Right. And so when you do run those urgency sales and, and you know, um, other time-sensitive emails, people take you seriously. They won't mm. if that's all you do. Right. But uh, if, you know, if you sandwich it with other uh, value-building con- high, you know, uh, content emails, then mm. people will take you seriously. Right. 
And with this uh, current situation, lockdown, quarantine, people not being able to step out, has it affected your business in any way? I understand you do, you work with SaaS uh, companies, so it's not a physical product mostly that you're talking about. Yeah. But uh, anyway, you know, but because I've seen this uh, behavior, uh, you know, kind of shift in customers. Now, uh, so I do some uh, online training programs and webinars, and I see a lot of people now that. Uh, you know, that, that have gone into kind of procrastination, permanent procrastination mode. Absolutely. And, yeah. you know, and I, I take this as an opportunity to learn new stuff for myself and to coach and teach new stuff to other people. But then the on the other side, so I want to new, know your perspective. Has it made an impact on your client's business? So you're a B2B right. uh, in, uh, yeah. business yourself, but yeah. what happens on the other side of your clients? If people are not buying those products, of course, at the end of the day, it's going to impact your business as well. How's that? Yeah. Been so up? Uh, I'm going to take this from industry wise. So SaaS mm. has really picked up. Uh, uh-huh. E-commerce has come down. But right. the interesting thing is that with e-commerce businesses, we're seeing an uptick in email open rates and click through rates. So people are shopping online. Okay. And if e-commerce businesses, like the biggest challenge right now is not customers not buying for Mm e-commerce businesses, the biggest challenge right now is shipping and delivering. And so if businesses can sort that out, then they're set. Um, Mm. And a lot of, as as lockdowns are opening across the world, I find that a lot of e-commerce businesses are coming back and Mm. emailing their lists and saying, hey, we're back in business, even though we, and and, you know, like start, you know, you can order from us now. And so Mm. I feel like e-commerce is the one industry that has grown in, uh, from a uh, from a customer's perspective, but from an industry perspective, it's also the industry that was affected the most because their supply chains were uh, interrupted with the lockdown. Right. For SaaS, it was it's software as a service. Mm. There's no supply chain there, and so it was business as usual. And in some cases, it it boomed. Okay, it did. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that depends. I think on the product as well. Yeah. So anything project management related, communications mm-hmm. related that allow people to continue working from home, that was that has really just picked up. Mm-hmm. Um, webinar softwares, especially, are even the ones that were in beta testing modes are just scrambling yeah. to um, you know test and launch their product so that they can uh, because their people are subscribing, people are using their products, and mm-hmm. so uh, user wise, they're out of the beta launch period. But feature-wise and testing-wise, they're still stuck there. So they're busy hiring people to get them to match the demand uh, mm. with, with, and preparing their software. And so I'm seeing a lot of uh, growth there. Mm. And I think this, uh, this is a very good indicator of where the world is going. We've always been talking about going digital and companies being forced to go digital overnight. Yeah. Uh, anywhere from uh, you know, financial institutions, banks, any any industry whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And I think the future is going digital. Uh, so I'm going to ske- segue into uh, your earlier uh, point about being the crazy ones and, uh, you know, special kind of mindset that requires uh, people to start on their own business and take that pain with the reward that comes along with it. But uh, tell me something, is it, is it something that can be built or are people born with it? Or is there a motivation or is there a mentor that guides you? Or maybe you can share your experience. Was there a mentor that, that inspired you and guided you to start your online, online business rather than, you know, just go for the normal nine to five job or just relax and enjoy and, and <laughs> have, a, have a really balanced, laid back housewife life? Um, so I was, interestingly, I've had all those experiences, right? Because mm-hmm. I was the six months that I was waiting for to start my driving license, I was the housewife and I was bored out of my mind. That, that's, that's not knocking down um, housewives. I was just a person who was not interested in um, mm. cooking. Cleaning is like low on my list of priorities. <laughs> and so like, I, to me, like studying and like working things out and solving problems has always been my thing. And so do I think entrepreneurship is born is inbuilt? No, it's not. Um, it is something that you either think about discover or like circumstances push you into it. But once you're there, um, and then, then it comes down to mindset. 
right? So right. whether you're right. doing it because you want to do it or whether you're doing it because circumstances pushed you into it, either mm. way, when things get cushioned uh, and you're in a good place, that's when you really realize whether you want to be an entrepreneur or whether you want to take it easy and go for something else, right? And for a lot of us, it's that's when we realize, no, we're, we're entrepreneurs by now. There's no way that we're going back. Mm. And honestly, if um, somebody came to me and said, you know, your kids are set for life, all your like needs are met for the rest of your life, I would still be an entrepreneur because I'd be like, what am I going to do with all that time? True. And so somebody would say like, pre-pandemic, somebody would say like, you could travel the world. And I'd be like, yes, but I would still need to, when I get there, I would still need something to do. There's only so much sightseeing that I can do and stuff. And so yeah. my mind is always always working like okay so if i'm traveling somewhere uh i'm mm. automatically looking at businesses there uh, i'm trying out their uh, e-commerce brands i'm looking at what's uh you know which um apps that country is using most and so it's mm. i don't think our mind ever really shuts down once we start being an entrepreneur mm -hmm. and that's not a curse that's not, not at all <laughs> i am never because bored yeah, because a lot of people think, oh, my God, you're not able to enjoy life the way it's supposed to be. You're always thinking your clock is always mm -hmm. ticking and all. But I think that's what gets you, you know, keeps on going in your mind yeah. that keeps you running. Absolutely. Uh, and one of the things that I find as my kids are growing up is that it's so important for them to see that they have career options other than a full time job. And so they can choose to follow their passions, whatever they may be, and still find a way to turn it into a business. And so right. I find that for me, being an entrepreneur is now important because I want my kids to know that there are options that they can, you know, carve out their own path. Right. But it comes with a lot of uh, pain and a lot of uh, uh, resilience. So yeah. would you like to advise something to budding entrepreneurs of what to expect when they dive into this journey? Because nobody, I mean, hardly anybody gets successful in the first attempt. The more you fail, the oh. more you learn and the better you get. But then, absolutely, you know, a lot of people break their back the first time or the second time. All right. So, so I'm going to share my experience and then talk about the advice, right? So the first 10 years of my business. I was a freelance writer. And even though I was writing for brands like Marriott and Intercontinental and uh, Interglobal PMI back then when it was called that, I think now it's Aetna, I was still barely breaking even. So even though I had all these big brands on my portfolio, I wasn't making enough money to be able to support my family. So it, I was in a, in a good position where my husband was, uh, working and so that, that part of the responsibility fell on him but I had no business sense much of it anyway and while I knew I was good at my work I knew I was working with big brands I my business was suffering and so it took me 10 years to realize that I needed help and that's when I went uh, and got myself some business coaching and uh, because I was in Dubai there were like certain challenges that nobody really could help me uh, with because they didn't understand the landscape and since my clients were all in the US and Canada and UK mm -hmm. uh, I needed coaches that would teach me to run a business in a way that where I would attract clients continue to attract clients from those countries and so I realized that this is something that I need to figure out on my own like this is something that nobody can teach me and that's where resilience comes in so you need to keep trying things, even, even if you think you're going to fail, you need to try it so that you have proof that this is going to fail. Right. And a lot of times for me, it turned out that I tried something convinced that this is going to fail and it didn't. Right. When I moved to Karachi, I thought this is not going to work out. I am leaving Dubai and moving to Karachi. How is this going to work? Like I, and my business in these two years has grown beyond anything that I was able to do in Dubai. And so I moved to Karachi thinking, okay, I need to find a way to get back to Dubai ASAP so that I can continue building a business. And it turns out that I don't need to because I built it to heights that I would, my, might have taken me like another five to seven years in Dubai. And I did it in two years. And, and so I would say um, men, find mentorship when you can. Find people who are running their own businesses so that you can talk to them and find out what those... Um, challenges are and 
be transparent and honest in your struggles. Because if you go down the route where you say, oh, I'm doing fine, and you don't really share your struggles, people are not going to come out and help you. Because people love helping each other, but they also need to know that you need help. And so be open to being vulnerable um, and trust one person at a time. So that if you find somebody's not trustworthy, you know who it is. Yeah. And so you never have to worry like, who do I trust? Who do I not trust? Be careful in finding, uh, you know, people you can trust. And then when you do trust them, just be transparent with them. And so I find that mentors played a really big role in with me and getting um, help in learning how to run a business that really just turned things around for me. Right. So some of the things, uh, because mentors, I say, are, are actually, you know, bouncing walls that you bounce your ideas with, but then they are also the mirrors that show you the real picture uh, of who you are inside you and why this thing happening is in your journey. And, you know, it's not like they will give you solutions, but they will show you the real picture so that you can build your own solutions. That's how I define mentors. Everybody has different experiences, but uh, other than that, you know, if somebody's giving a solution, they might, they might as well be called as coaches or uh, trainers or things like that. But uh, any particular specific incident that occurred in your career that your mentor helped you get out of, you realize what to do and that which helped you traject your business upwards. Yes. So my first mentor turned out to be my client, right? And so that client needed an ebook written and I sent him my rates and he uh -huh. sent back my proposal saying, raise your rates and send it back to me. Oh, and so that doesn't that's, happen normally. <laughs> that doesn't happen. And I was so shocked, but then I got on a call with him and he said, your, I've seen your work. It is worth a lot more. Charge me more. Um, and then we'll talk. And so I raised, doubled my rates, sent him the proposal and he accepted it, but he said you could have raised them more. And so that yeah. really just changed my mindset into thinking that I need to value my work more than my client values it. Because but then, sorry, Summer, I'm going to stop you yeah, here. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm uh, destroying your train of thought, but this is a very good discussion that I've had a lot of times. So that's why I wanted to, I didn't want to forget it. So uh, about rates, about yeah. rates, people starting off, you know, everybody's conservative. Everybody wants to have a you know chunk of the pie. Everybody wants to get in the ring. So a lot of times people undersell themselves. In fact, mostly people undersell themselves, but they're not confident enough of charging what they think, even if they think that they're worth more, they don't uh, charge that much. You know, maybe similar to what you experienced. Yeah. But then at the same time, how do they build that confidence that no, it's okay to charge more and be rejected a couple of times rather than um, negotiate and undersell yourself. And then, but then there could be some ways where you could, you were, you know, you have some challenges, you have some financial commitments, and then where you would say, okay, I'm going to, you know, compromise this time. So is there, is there a, I mean, it's a thin line, but is there a guidance? Is there something, some advice? Okay. So, uh, yes, there is. And it is that if you're in a position where you need work, where you have mm -hmm. more time than money, then you take on whatever work you're getting and you do what you have to do. Right. I will never like, uh, that's how I started off. Right. My first article was for $10. And when I quit freelance writing, I was charging a thousand dollars for a blog post. And so you, as long as you keep stepping up, that's fine. Like accept low paying work. If you need to, there's nothing wrong with that. But at, as your work fills out and you keep getting inquiries, just quote higher and higher with every coming, uh, with every new client who reaches out to you. And so slowly okay. you're going to leave those low rates behind and get to a point where you're actually charging what you want to charge. And right. when it comes to rates, I have like a simple, simple formula. It needs to be an amount that makes you want to get out of bed in the morning. Right now, if that amount is low by the industry standards, so what it is helping mm -hmm. you feel good about yourself, about your business. And you know, it's, it's, it's making you realize that your business is moving forward. That's fine. And so mm -hmm. as you grow, just keep coding higher and higher until you start getting rejected. And that's uh -huh. when you know that, okay, so I need to uh, maybe stick to these rates 
for now. And also, when somebody says you you charge too much, your rates are too high, always ask them, okay, compared to what? Right. Right. And mm. then see what they say, because then that will give you the context to negotiate. Mm-hmm. And so if somebody says, oh, I can find writers, you know, a lot cheaper and at Upwork or Fiverr, but then you have to ask them, <laughs> all right, sure, that's your prerogative, but something happened that made you reach out to me and not go to Upwork and Fiverr. Right. Right. So this is, this is a conversation that you have to have with yourself first so that you can have it with clients and always know that somebody saying your rates are high or saying we, you know, this is out of our budget. It, it's mm. always open for negotiation. It is always relationship building. If mm. you know that whatever their lo- rates are that they can afford to pay is a hard no for you. Don't just cancel it out. Say, okay, sure. I, I can, you know, refer a junior copywriter to you mm-hmm. or a junior, whoever to you. And so I feel like that is really, that really helps. Right. So yeah. When it comes to rate, it needs to be a number that helps you get out of bed in the morning, whether that's low, whether that's high, that's up to you. Um, And also just keep learning because Mm. you cannot expect to not learn and grow your rates at the same time. So the more you learn, the more your skill set expands, the better you'll feel, the more justified you'll feel about charging higher. Mm. Right. And do you have a formulaic answer to the great question of we'll give you exposure you know no hard <laughs> no because you can create has your that own happened to you? i'm sure that must have happened to you oh well. oh yeah it hasn't happened to me in like four or five years but in the beginning mm. it used to and i did fall victim to it i was like so there was this guy who reached out saying oh we're launching a new blog and we need blog writers and so he's like but i don't have like the money to pay for it i wrote mm-hmm. seven blog posts and the, the blog never launched. I never saw those articles published anywhere. And that's when I realized, okay, no exposure. Even if they say I could claim whatever wins I want, no, that is never going to happen. Hmm. But if you, again, it's circumstantial. You need to say, like, if uh, my ideal client came to me today hmm. and said something like, will you create an email sequence for us for exposure? I'd be like, yeah, I want your exposure by getting on your podcast and I can, you know, do an audit. I will not write their emails for them, but I will audit two to three emails mm. for them. Takes right. me like half an hour and right. uh, I, I get on their podcast. Right. So make so sure kind of that return, when, you know, if yes. Not in, yeah. Yes. So if, if you are considering kind. working for free, it needs to be a fair exchange. Yeah. That makes sense. Dif- and this, that's yeah. where a lot of people, a lot of people, uh, suffer because they don't understand that it's not always the the revenue in terms of cash cash flow you know there's a, a revenue stream in if if they want you for exposure then you they should also be able to give you that kind of exposure yeah. if something in return of equal value that makes a lot of sense right uh, in this uh, so the whole landscape is changing the world is going to come yeah. out uh, completely different out of this Everybody's praying, hoping, wishing we come out of this as soon as possible. A lot of businesses are going bust. A lot of people are out losing their jobs or they have uh, you know, a, a significant decrease in their uh, pay scales. And uh, a lot of people are being frustrated because of that. You know? So what do you think is the best uh, strategy for people now, because I know people, uh, you know, people have more time on their hands, yeah. even if you're working full time. Uh, but you, uh, the fact that you're working from home saves you a lot of time. And I recently had an, uh, an online training where I asked my audience, uh, you know, the, can you quantify the amount of time that you're saving? And no, and nobody could because we don't think that yeah. way. And then I said, hey, you're not traveling an hour and you know, you've, you've lived in UAE, you know, you know the, the amount of traffic jams we have here. And you know, you're not spending two hours, two and a half hours uh, both ways in traffic. Yeah. That's you uh, earning two and a half hours of your life. Uh, so what is the best uh, strategy for people who have some time at their hands and they're also working to be financially stable to maybe develop something as a a side business that can later on develop into a full-time business. 
Okay, Where should so they start? Is- what should they look for? And uh, how to actually get going? Because we also have to counter the 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 mental frustration and and the the fear that we have in us of what's going to happen. You know, health wise, financial wise, job, everything. So how yeah. do we go about that? Um, so again, I feel like this is a mindset question, but also with the free time that we have, um, I would say take care of yourself first, right? And if that, for a lot of us, that means like leaning into our hobbies, but for others who have financial worries and stuff, they don't have that luxury, right? But the one thing that all of us do have are hobbies. Hmm. Um, and so find a way to see if you can turn a hobby into a side hustle, right? Right. I know somebody who was a voracious knitter. It was her way of de-stressing. And Mm -hmm. now that she's home, she's knitting and selling whatever she's making. Mm. Right. And it's not enough to be a business on its own right now, but it is enough to supplement her income. It is enough that she knows that God forbid, if things go bust, this is something that she can go all in. Right. And so this is also, um, if you don't have hobbies that can be monetized or that you, that aren't giving you ideas, look at your professional life. What do you have? What skill sets do you have that mm. can make you, um, you know, start your own business? And so mm. for, okay. for project managers, that means hiring themselves out as project managers for like other uh, industries, right? Mm. So one of the things that, because I'm in this field, when people launch courses or when people launch these big programs, they don't do it themselves. They have an entire team that is led by a project manager. Right. And so these are, you need to start researching into what other industries use somebody with your skill set, And uh-huh. then you need to start educating yourself at the same time, trying to figure out how to start a business, how you can turn your skill set and your knowledge and your expertise into a service or, or even a product. So productized services is a term that I use often in my business. It's uh, when I know that a service that I offer requires a set, a number of steps. Mm-hmm. And then I turn this into a product, I say, which is what my, what my audits are. So I do email audits, which is I go through up to 12 emails and I audit them and I find out what's working well, what's not working well, what can be improved and what needs to change to increase conversions, right? And I found that I was doing the same steps irrespective of what kind of email sequence I was um, uh, doing, uh, auditing. And so I turned that into a productized service, which is low in cost only because it doesn't take me as much time anymore because I've perfected my process. And so people can sign up for it and I know I'll be done within two days. And Uh so it's not as high as my um, per project rate, but it's a service that fills out my empty days, especially if I'm in a, uh, I only take on one big project at a time because um, the kind of work that I do, a a single big project can go as long as like three to five months. And so I have pockets of days and hours in the middle that are just empty because I'm waiting on client approval or I'm conducting customer interviews and there's just this time in the middle between schedule calls. And so productized service helped me fill that time while still making money. So find a way to convert your knowledge, skills, Mm -hmm. uh, professional experience, your hobbies into something that you can offer as a service. Right. And it's becoming easier now to build your skills and to learn new skills because all of these uh, online uh, websites like Udemy and Skillshare and all, they have millions of courses and they're now coming up with promotions, uh, you know, even free programs. Yesterday, I was looking so, at, a, at some of the programs. Yeah, I have another example to share. Like my financial planner hmm. is uh, st- was starting to see that her clients had their businesses get affected, right? But because she's a fine accountant, financial planner, they were still, you know, she her business wasn't suffering, but her clients were starting to suffer. And so she started offering these consultation hours where she coached her clients uh, and other businesses on how to um, COVID proof their finances, basically. And then that kind of uh, branched off into teaching women how to manage their finances even better. So now she's coaching like four to five different kinds of people 
through like an hour of consulting. And that's like, she created another income stream for herself. And so think along those terms. What can you teach somebody in an hour? Right. And so once you sense. start, once and you start teaching that topic, for right. you, it's teaching people the same thing again and again. But for them, for every other client or, or person that you teach, for them, it's mind blowing stuff that's going to help them. Mm -hmm. Right. That makes a lot of sense because if you if you're able to, I, I I like to compare this with the rabbit hole of YouTube that everybody falls victim to. And then you, you think you're going to watch a 10 minute video and then you end up being on YouTube for two hours watching completely use this crap. And <laughs> if people can build something that adds value and is uh, maybe, you know, a small bite size information uh, hour, even less, maybe yeah. I think that's a, that's a good way to start. Right, uh, Summer, we, uh, I mean, we, I'm really enjoying this uh, conversation. Uh, I want to know, as a new startup, as a new entrepreneur, what is the best way to build your brand and build your value in the industry? Because when you are joining, when you're starting out, you will get victimized, uh, you will yes. get uh, monopolized. There will be challenges of you getting uh, recognized we see this uh, day in and day out, multiple videos on YouTube, how to get your first 1,000 subscribers and how to, you know, come on first page of Google and things like that. What, what was your learning when you were building your brand? Did you go through the organic growth structure or did you uh, catalyze it through any means? And what would you like to advise other people thinking about this? Okay, so I was lucky that I had client work before I realized that I needed to build my brand. And okay. I, for the longest time, I was uh, subcontracting for other marketers and uh, email copywriters as I was growing my email marketing business. Um, and so I realized after a while that I had become like the best kept secret, right? Mm -hmm. I was writing because I was partnering with these marketers and other copywriters, I was writing for some really, really big brands and I was writing their emails, but there was no recognition. Like nobody knew who I was, even though I had all this um, expertise now. So I have gone, as I build my brand more this year, I have gone the organic route, right? Mm -hmm. Because even though I don't have a brand, I do have connections. And, right. and I do have a solid network. And so I launched an um, email newsletter, which is something that I didn't have, even though I'm an email marketing <laughs> person. Um, and I have built that organically. But from the first email, I made sure that all of my best content was going out to my email subscribers. So uh -huh. when now when people say, oh, I want to learn from you, the first thing I say is get on my email list because whether I hold a webinar or mm -hmm. it's, a, it's my weekly email with, with email marketing um, info and insights, that's where it goes first, right? I don't share, uh, what I share on like social media is maybe like 50% of what it goes into my email newsletter. And so I'm starting to do this organically, um, mm -hmm. but for somebody who needs to build a brand fast, I would say think in terms of exposure rather than in terms of ads. Uh, exposure is free and it, it's, it doesn't mean working for exposure for free. It <laughs> means getting, getting on podcasts, do it, uh, getting your, uh, you know, starting like maybe a medium blog uh, hmm. because who wants the hassle of starting like, you know, how do you get on podcasts? You pitch <laughs> because the one thing I realized is that podcasts hosts are always looking for guests. Mm, and so yes, we are. make the effort, make the effort of listening to two to three episodes, email that the host saying, Hey, I really enjoyed this interview. And this bit was really insightful. And right. then say, Hey, I, this is what I specialize in whatever. And if you know, I would love to be a guest on your uh, podcast. It's as simple as that. Just make right. sure you personalize it and then get it. And there's so many just open Apple podcasts and like whatever industry you're in, whatever you want to talk about, mm -hmm. run a search, you'll find like a bunch of things. And also pitches are always a numbers game. So mm -hmm. don't send three and get disheartened that you didn't hear back. Because, mm -hmm. because of this pandemic, I am finding that people are also 
batching their interviews and then releasing them slowly. So for, for like two of my favorite podcasts, uh, uh, freelancing podcasts, they're recorded six months in advance. And so I know that if I send a pitch today, mm-hmm. they're not going to need me for another six months. And so my job is to network with them and mm-hmm. stay on top of mind and continue, you know, interacting with them so that when they start booking guests again, yeah. um, they will think of me and they will remember and I will resend them the pitch. I, I wouldn't like send them once and forget. And I would say, mm-hmm. hey, I sent you a pitch back then. I'm sending it again. I would love to be on your podcast. Right. So again, be willing to be vulnerable. Be willing to say that, you know, you, you really want to be a guest on their podcast. No, believe it or not, Samar, you know, I've gone the other way around as a podcast okay. host. I know it's counterintuitive, but, uh, uh, you know, I've actually cut down my backlog. I don't, right. uh, I've resorted to not having much backlog. So for okay. example, today is the 8th of May that we are uh, recording this podcast. It's going to be out day after tomorrow, which is the 10th of May. So I have episodes coming out every 10 days. Uh, and, and I'm usually recording podcast, uh, two or three, maximum four or five days in advance. And, uh, before the pandemic, I used to have at least four or five episodes, uh, in queue, uh, not as much as six months because I have a full-time job and I'm, yeah. uh, I'm doing these podcasts usually over weekends, you know, with my wife and, uh, but now I've deliberately stopped doing that. And the reason I feel, I don't know, many podcasters would agree or not is because what you exactly, what you said right now is that a lot of people have a lot of backlog. So people sitting at home who want to be on podcast, or if I want somebody to be on the podcast, if I want someone to be on my podcast as guest, and we are talking about the COVID-19 pandemic, and I already have six months of uh, episodes in queue, by the time summer's episode goes live, COVID-19 may not be relevant. Yeah. Right. That's so, true. so, so I've taken so the other again, route. Yeah. I love that you uh, brought this up because b- then podcast hosts, it's not set in stone. Right. So yeah, if something like a I pandemic mean, yeah. happens, yeah. they can push their yeah. recorded, uh, because then there, those episodes are suddenly not relevant. Yeah, of course. And no, so, no, that makes sense. So, yeah. that, that choice is there always. It's always yeah. there. And that's where you know, networking but, comes in play. Because yeah. if you're staying on top of mine, you're staying in. So when when a spot opens up, yeah. you need like they can get get in touch with exactly. you. Exactly, exactly. So I I usually have three or four guests lined up, but then I shoot as close to the deadline as possible, keeping myself comfortable uh, to be able to post it and publish and uh, market it and all of that. But other than that, I've 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 reduced my my buffer time. I mean, sometimes okay. I feel you know it's 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 like uh, staying on the edge of almost yeah. losing your schedule, but it's been working yeah. out fine till now. Uh, but yeah, that's, that is some very good insight on uh, building your brand, your business, things that people, you know, budding entrepreneurs go, go through. Thank you very much for being on the episode and uh, I wish you all the success. It was a great discussion and we'll uh, continue to uh, maybe connect again once you know, the landscape changes and you have some other insights to, uh, to share. But it all was right. a great Thank one. you for having me, Furu. Thank you Thank for you. having me. Okay. All right, guys. We'll see you in the next episode. Stay safe, stay home, and take care of yourselves.